because there's this bit where he's talking about how trains are the only mode of transport because these cars and the goodly batteries. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to episode 34 of the Screenplay Archaeology Podcast. I am your host, Kiermit Head, and today I'm bringing you a new solo episode in which I'm going to be covering the script called Isobar, which was a project by the studio Karolka, which was big in the late 80s and early 90s. They did films like RoboCop and Total Recall and most famously Terminator 2 before they finally ended up going under and going bankrupt because of a rather expensive flop known as Cutthroat Island. And it was meant to be a, a Sylvester Stallone project. And the storyline of Isobar is basically, to give a very brief summary, because there's a lot more detail I'm going to have to go into later, is that we're in this sort of far-off dark future of 2016, <laughs> where basically the hole in the ozone layer has gotten worse, and sea levels have risen, and the earth has been turned into kind of the scorched desert, and the air and the rain are toxic. And society, for the most part, has kind of fled behind these domes and undergrounds. So that's where the cities are. And so it starts in New Los Angeles. And more or less what happens is that because of all the problems with the atmosphere and the ozone and pollution and whatnot, jet travel has been banned and car travel has been severely restricted to cars that are electric and therefore don't go very far and the batteries don't hold a charge. So everyone travels around by train. And they're now setting up this new inaugural first intercontinental travel since since jet travel was banned on this new train called the Isobar, which is going to go from Los Angeles to Quebec. I, they don't say where in Quebec. I'm assuming it's either Montreal or Quebec City. They just say, oh, it's Isobar control in Quebec. And eventually they're going to go o over Greenland, down to Iceland. And then they're going, and they're eventually going to end up in London, which is their final destination. But what happens is that these military, these company guys who are mercenaries have snuck this mysterious plant like creature on board, and it gets loose and starts attacking people and causing problems. And so all of the passengers, this huge cast of characters, end up having to deal with this disaster situation and try and get out of this alive and also stop the creature and the people who are keeping the creature alive because they need it for their purposes that's more or less a plot summary of the script that i kind of mangled a little bit so yeah that's the summary now before i get into the script i'm going to get into the background of this thing a little bit and i'm not going to get into the background of the people involved as much as much this time as i sometimes normally do because hey, it would take forever if i went through sylvester stallone's entire filmography and a lot of it would have been hey i haven't seen this movie because i haven't seen everything he's done because frankly i don't need to see rhinestone or staying alive or Party at Kitty and Studs. But yeah, but now I'm just going to talk about sort of the history of this project in general. Now, a lot of this information I'm going to be sourcing from uh, Tales from Development Hell by David Hughes, which is one of the best sort of what-if books I've ever read. And I would definitely recommend you go check this out. And if I stop talking and you hear like some clinking sounds or anything, it's because I got a cold, so I'm going to be drinking water throughout this thing. But So I apologize for that. But now the basic history of this is that it started... As a spec script by a writer named Jim Ools, who later went on to adapt Fight Club and did some other stuff called Dead Reckoning. And it was about a creature that gets loose on a high-speed runaway underground train that was a humanoid with a genetically altered brain that was intended to be used as the hard drive in an artificial intelligence project. And I'm assuming that the trains and such... I'm assuming it's not intercontinental at this point. It's not specific. So that's basically the the original spec script. And so Kuralko bought this script. And they brought Ridley Scott in around 1988 to direct it. But he eventually left. Like, he was only working on it for a very short time. And it almost seems like there was never an official deal. And the working title changed to The Train... And he brought, he talked to, he talked to H.R. Giger to do uh, artwork for it without actually showing him the script, just saying it was going to be about a train. 
And so Giger did all these, did all this like design work for it. And there's some crazy stuff that's described that I've never actually seen the artwork for. I haven't been able to find it. Like, like apparently there was like this ejector, like there was like this safety, like escape pod thing where they get shot out like an ejaculation and they're covered in foam. And I'm like, okay, Giger, calm down. <laughs> but then Giger just never really heard back from Ridley Scott until after he left the project so that never went anywhere and eventually he repurposed his ideas for the train for the nightmare sequence and species which was even cut down from the idea he had for it got cut down from like 30 seconds to like 12 and so that would have been interesting to see depending on uh, which version they would have you know what the script would have been like it would have been interesting to see Ridley Scott direct that especially 1988 Ridley Scott when before he went crazy, before he got old and went completely crazy, basically. And so it, it kept moving around. And after Scott left, Joel Silver, who had been brought on as the producer, who was a big producer, had done Lethal Weapon, 48 Hours, a whole bunch of movies. He came on and he worked with Ools to try and get the script rewritten. And he decided that he wanted the script to be called Isobar instead of Dead Reckoning because he really liked this word. It was the title of another project he had been attached to that never got made. And an Isobar, the word Isobar is like from my geography and uh, geology studies. When you look at a topographical map and there's like lines representing elevation, every now and then at a certain interval, there'll be like a thick line, which represents like an equal distance from each thicker line. And that's an isobar, basically. Like, they're periodic. Periodically, those lines will be thicker over like a specific interval. That's an isobar, I believe, from my from my studies quite a few years ago. And so, Ools had to write around this, and so he came up with a meaning for it, which was intercontinental subterranean oscillomagnetic ballistic aerodynamic railway. Huh? <laughs> So basically it's, yeah, your new title is kind of bullshit, but I found a way to work around it. And the new version is in a more distant future. The creature was changed to be an evolutionary leap, Rules recalls, a super adaptive humanoid that was caught thriving outside in the environment that's hostile to humans. It is put onto the train to be transported to a special lab. It breaks free. And that must adapt faster and more dramatically to stay alive inside the train. It requires massive doses of adrenaline to do this, so it kills people to get it. And what the thing would do, from what I've read in other quotes, is that it would like it had like these long fingernails that would stick into people's heads and suck the adrenaline out from their brains like that. That could have been a cool monster. And so at this point, they brought it in uh, Roland Emmerich to direct this, based off of his film Moon Forty Four which apparently Silver was somewhat impressed with. And so they brought him on to direct the film. And what happened was that Roland Emmerich, he wanted to work with Dean Devlin on the script. And they kind of did a rewrite, which never, which they never really fully fleshed out or finished. But then Karolka decided they would go with um, Stephen E. DeSouza, who Joel Silver had worked with, and he was a big screenwriter at the time. Because like I said, Die Hard, Die Hard 2, Commando. And he did rewrites on Demolition Man, I believe, and he would later do <sighs> Judge Dredd. But that's a story for a different day. And he also worked on The Running Man. And so he changed it. And so he came in to write this script, and it was Stallone was signed on to write it. And he came in, and, and basically, like, Stallone was also part of this decision because of uh, the Demolition Man rewrites. And so Stephen Edesalza came in and basically he rewrote the thing from scratch and turned it into more of this big, large-scale ensemble piece disaster movie, which is what we have in the script. And he changed a bunch of things around because he felt like the previous versions were too much like Alien and Aliens and he wanted to do something different. He said there were things in it that didn't make sense. Like he said, it didn't make sense that that they would have the monster on the train and also have to take the train to the final destination. So he introduced this idea of they have to get it to, like, it's like this intercontinental trip or something. And I'm not really sure what he's talking about when he says this, because he says, well, it doesn't make any sense that they go to the final destination. Wouldn't they have an airstrip nearby or something like that? And I, I'd like to read those earlier drafts just so I can have more context for his remarks. But so he created this whole concept and he said he changed the main character to what Stallone ends up being in the movie, which is more of an ordinary guy, whereas in the earlier drafts he was the scientist who brings it on board the train, 
and his reasoning was, well, if you make him this scientist guy, then you've broken him as a hero because he put all these people in danger by putting this monster on the train. And the other thing he changed was that he made um, he made the plant monster he made the monster into a plant monster instead of a humanoid because he said he wanted to get away from the he wanted to get away from the man in a suit look or something like that. And so he changed a whole bunch of things around. That leads us to the script we have now. And I guess I'll just get on into that. Now, it starts off with, they, introdu- they introduce us to this dark near future world of 2016 where everyone's had to, you know, the cities have all been contained behind domes and walls and some of them are underground and the only manageable transportation is by train. And reading this whole this whole introduction to this world, I'm like, wow, people really thought the real 2016 was bad. They they don't know. And we're introduced to this idea that there's people who do live in the desert outside the city, but they often don't talk. And they, they have to, you know, they have to like speak through, they have to read like body language and gestures. And so we have these two who are an old man and, and a teenage boy who are both named Gibran. And they've been watching this building for these these two guys called Lardner and Essaker at this, they're at like this like secret hidden like train station. They get off their train and they go to this lab where they capture the escaped tendrilled creature that we don't quite see. And then like apparently these two have seen too much, so they killed the old man. But Gibran gets away and he follows their their light rail train into the walled city of New Los Angeles or New Lay as it's called. And then we see this city and we see the fact that there's very few cars and the ones that have are on electric batteries. And we get introduced to this isobar train, which is making the first intercontinental travel to London via Greenland and Iceland since jets were banned. And like these new tunnels and bridges have all been finally built and they're going to make this trip. And this is where we meet all the characters that are boarding the train. And it's a lot of them. There's Hedda Caulfield, who's a, I believe like her comp she's like this old woman who's like like her family owns the company. I believe they own the water resources or something like that. And she has this bodybuilder guy named Tony who's her bodyguard, who's also a celebrity in his own right. Now, Hedda, I believe, is the character that the Salza said he wrote specifically for Sophia Loren. And so and but yeah, I believe that was her, and that would have been interesting. Um her you have uh, your, her, her, like I said, her bodyguard Tony, who in some scenes he reads like Lou Ferrigno, and other scenes he reads a lot like Arnold, because there's this bit where he's talking about how trains are the only way to transport because these cars and the goodly batteries and stuff like that, which just made me think of Arnold. And then her granddaughter Lisa, who there's this whole thing about how she's arranging a marriage with this guy who's the heir to like an oil company, I think, in England, who sh- only shows up in like the last two pages, and he seems like kind of a decent guy, so he kind of gets thrown under the bus by the storyline a little bit. And then there's this doctor named Wayne Scott who makes a joke about how like, oh, if the polar ice caps really are melting, then well, I guess I'll worry about where to get the ice for my drinks. And what's weird about the polar ice cap thing is that they treat it like it's this like it's this like it's this shocking reveal that like the glaciers are calving and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, so if the oceans have risen, where did the wa- water come from for the oceans to rise if it's not the glaciers melting? It, it it just seems like people would know all about that. To me at least it sounds like that, but so that's a little weird thing I'm not I'm not quite sure about. And and then there's um Scanlan and Ruby, who are doctors escorting a patient in some sort of like life support machine, and then there's Sari McCoy, who's the purser for the journey, and she's like basically in charge of everything, making sure it goes smoothly. And that role was um was set up to be Kim Basinger. And then there's this there's this new mate, there's a self made man and his girlfriend. It's Reggie Rossiter and Debbie. And Reggie was supposed to be um James Belushi. And the thing with him is that he start he started this like startup company called Kids R Us, where they will, where people are having trouble having kids, they will selectively genetically breed kids and sell them to people. And so he's now a rich man. He's getting on the he's getting on this, he he's getting on he's getting on this on this um on this train. And they get conned by this guy named Corbald, who was supposed to be Michael Jeter. And he scans their tickets and he does. He takes the information off their tickets and basically gives himself a first class ticket. And there's this guy named Prine, who is Sylvester Stallone's character, and he's working for someone named Dupree, and they don't say who it is. And he's apparently undercover, but they don't really talk about who he is. 
they don't they don't really talk about who he is yet but he's doing this thing where he's apparently observing things and no one's supposed to know he's there and they explain that later and the basic twist being is that he's not really anyone special he's just kind of an ordinary guy which we'll i'll get to in a moment and that that's stallone's character and there's a few miscellaneous left there's a security guy named hawk there's the engineer who's bertrand who for some reason i was just thinking uh, i was just thinking brent spiner for some reason with him i don't know why uh there's leslie the bartender and uh Essaker and lardner who were at the uh who were at the lab and picked up the monster they get on the train as well and also there's this woman who you see like i mean i'm only mentioning her because she gets a death scene later and that's daphne who's this woman you see sitting at the bar on the train and jabron like stows away on the train as well because he's following these guys to um get his revenge on them to, to avenge his grandfather's death and so we get to see the the airline boarding routine and where sorry and uh, the various stewardesses in the different parts of the train they're explaining the emergency procedures including like the hydraulic life pods that detach from the train and the oxygen supplies that are kept under the seat that these people can breathe in this fucked up atmosphere until the rescue teams come for them and also it's explained that there's this that basically the train is divided in half you have like the first class passengers up front you have these different cars in between you have the kitchen the I was a little weird about the, it was a little strange to me the way this train was set because it seems like the baggage cars are put in front of the kitchen and the medical car. That seems a little weird, but you have the kitchen, the medical car, which is where the, the pod is being stored with the quote unquote patient in it. And then you, and then you have the kitchen and I'm not really sure which one of those is in front of which. And then in the back you have the, you have the poor people who are all piled up and they're getting served by like these robots, which there's this reference to, oh, it's like the robotic mail carriers from the 1980s. And I'm like, did I miss something? Did robots deliver mail back in the 80s and no one told me about it? Because the, the mental image I'm getting of that is the fucking robot from Rocky IV walking around going, happy birthday, Polly, and giving people their mail. Like, was that actually a thing? <laughs> I'm really curious about that. And also, uh, Reggie and Debbie end up back there because of the incident with the with their tickets getting uh, screwed up. And so the train it it gets also. Oh wait, I gotta mention before before I get to um anything else, I gotta talk about this future because this is written in 1990. It's dated uh, December 1st, 1990, and so it does some predictive things about the future, which are kind of unintentionally hilarious. Reading this in 2018. Because Reggie and Debbie are walking along the platform before they get on the train talking about how they're psyched that they're going to get to see King Charles and Queen die. And I had to stop reading for a few minutes. So I'm like, wow, that's double the unintentional awkwardness. Because <laughs> not only did they get divorced after this script, appar apparently, but she also died. <laughs> and then later on, there's a bit where they're like, where the characters are speculating on who is being, who's being transported in the medical car, who's in that life support thing. And they're like, I heard it's Michael Jackson. It's like, and that he's going to London for like these these youth cures, and it's like, isn't he sixty by now? It's like, no, his monkey's sixty. He's only fifty six, and it's like, wow. Not only is he dead, but they're making monkey jokes, which kind of went out of. I I haven't heard many Michael Jackson monkey jokes in, in quite a while. I mean, it's mainly just been child molester jokes. So it's like that's kind of out of date. And I'm pretty sure. And there's like a running gag about the Michael Jackson thing. Because they find out what's what's in that little um, tube. It's like, well, it's definitely not Michael Jackson. I'm like, hell. But so the train's getting up to cruising speed. And pretty much throughout this entire setup, Prine is just making a nuisance of himself. Like asking questions, inconveniencing the staff. Like giving them all this crap about like, oh, you have to offer about like alternative stuff about alternative meals and a special pillow. And basically making an ass out of himself. And he's also taking pictures and recording notes. And so it's kind of like, huh, what's going on? And I believe it's at some point around here where we see uh, Gibran inside the luggage cars. And you see Reggie and Debbie, like, they, they just decide to force their way towards the front. And eventually they get back. And you find out that Ruby and Scanlon, they're working with Essaker and Lardner. And that the patient inside the little pod is, or the whatever it is, it's called like a bottle, I think. It's the it's the it's the creature and it's this weird plant creature which has tendrils and kind of has a little face on it. And they're like pumping it full of electricity to like keep its growth under control. And they're doing it periodically and they have this entire medical car to themselves too, which is part of the cover up, I guess. Meanwhile, Ezekiel and Lardner are just sleeping in their own cabins. 
And Corbald, he hears like the speculation about who this wealthy passenger is. And so he heads back to the private car disguised as a steward to take a look around. And then he's looking at this pod. And he like burns his hand on like the cryogenic freezing. And so, and then, and then Scanlan just straight, just stabs him and kills him. And this distracts them long enough that they miss applying the electricity. And so the creature starts to break out. And so Scanlan goes and he's like, he's trying to dispose of the body. And while this is going on, that like the other passengers are in the dining car, and this holographic show is playing with like all these like past celebrities getting brought to life and doing performances. There's Elvis, Marilyn Monroe, Judy Garland, and I'm sure they would have put more in if they could have. Now that's reminding me, interestingly enough, of Blade Runner 2049, the way they brought Elvis and Sinatra and a couple other people back to life with holograms. That was pretty cool, and so it was interesting seeing how this script predicted the future in a different way and kind of correctly. And so this show is going on and Prine's dictating his notes and he sees Gibran kind of stick his hand in and snatch some leftover chicken. There, there was a scene in here where he meets Lisa and they talk and they kind of bond and stuff. And that sets up a romantic subplot, which isn't the greatest part of the script, but it gets doesn't get that much focus. So so it doesn't bother me that much. And so Prine kind of follows him to a luggage car, but loses track of him. And then he sees scanlan trying to shove corbald's body into this into this into like this box and they start fighting there's actually this pretty cool fight between um between prine and scanlan where they there's like art being being transported to london they're like hitting each other with the art and like scanlan's going after him with a knife and tries to stab him and then but then the alarm gets set off and so sorry and hawk show up in response to the alarm and then scanlan runs off and they find the body of Corbald, and and going by his ticket information, they assume that he's Reggie Rossiter. And then Scanlan finds the mo- goes back to the medical car, and he finds the monster has escaped and killed Ruby, and then gets killed himself. Like it attacks him, and you don't see what happens yet, but I'll get to that in a minute. And while Pride's being interrogated, he he reveals that he works for the company, and he's this VP of something. And he's paid to anonymously board these trains and like look for problems and things that he can fix and like and like to basically just make a nuisance of himself just to see how they perform under pressure. And I thought that was an interesting sort of idea for a main character, this guy whom you assume is some sort of spy or something, but it turns out he's just a he's just a pencil pusher basically. And apparently Stallone was kind of pushing for him being more of an ordinary guy, and he was very he was very um insistent on not on this not being rambo on a train and i actually think it's kind of interesting because it kind of falls in line with the things he was doing around this time because you know he had a uh, rocky five where he kind of tried to bring it back to a more grounded place and that movie doesn't work and movies like daylight and even cliffhanger where he is more more of you know a, a grounded ordinary guy and he's a good enough actor he can pull that off because remember you know the early rocky movies and even the first rambo he has this kind of you know you know, you know, real life kind of quality to him. He's a good enough actor. He could have pulled this off. And I kind of like the idea of him being just a sort of pencil pusher who's forced to step up and kind of be the action hero a little bit. I think it kind of works. And it never feels ridiculous the way this is written. And so they stop at Salt Lake City because, you know, because they have to report the killing. And then and what happens is that Prine calls up his boss, who's Dupree, who is the guy who's the head of the whole company. And Dupree says, you have to keep this train going, blah, blah, blah. And so... And so Prime bullshits his way with the local police captain who's named Young to let the train continue on its way. And Young agrees, but he insists that, hey, he has to board the train to investigate the murder. Now, this char- the idea of this character was that they stop and they bring this guy on who's written for a Clint Eastwood type, like another like kind of action hero actor with the idea being that he would be, you know, that maybe he would be the hero of the movie to the audience. Well, he gets on board and they go to the medical car and they find these shriveled up corpses of Scanlan and Ruby and base and they crumble the dust when they hit the floor. And basically what it is is that the monster needs to absorb a whole ton of moisture and it does it by basically sucking the water out of people and killing them. And so they go into the medical car and it and it's and, and like it's it's grabbing it pops up from under the floor and is like grabbing at them with its tentacles. And it manages to grab Young and like, and it starts to like feed off of him, but then he blows his brains out before it can finish. Now, the thing with that is, is that if you're going to have this like decoy protagonist character or this decoy hero, 
you kind of need to have him stick around a little bit longer if you're going to if that's going to have much of an impact because you can't just have like like DeSalza mentions it in the book. He, there's a quote where he talks about how it was like, oh, it's going to be like this Clint Eastwood type, and then he would die, and it would be shocking. The problem is, is that there's not enough time here to really be like, oh, this character, oh, cool, it's Clint Eastwood. What's he going to do? Oh, he dies immediately. Like that, I don't think that would have played too well. And the idea that they can stop at just some random city along the way, I think that takes away a little bit from the suspense and the tension because I like the idea that they can't stop necessarily, that they have to deal with this creature. And the fact that they have to contrive a way to keep the train going, I feel like that whole part of the script could be fixed a little bit, but it's not a huge problem. But then the creature punches through the floor and it escapes into the bilge below. Now, what's interesting about this is that there's spaces oh above and underneath. You have the bilge underneath, and I forget what they call the area overhead, but it's it's only in this front half of the train. The, the section of the poor people doesn't have that, so they're never in any danger in this, which makes me wonder why we bothered with that whole section of the train. If only if we're going to, like, prefigure, we're going to, we're going to foreshadow Snowpiercer with less uh, dismemberment. And so, basically, Sari announces an emergency, and the first-class passengers have to move towards the front to the observation room, which is, like, right under the nose. It's 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 right in the nose of the train and right above them is where the engineers are, from what I remember. And while this is going on, um, Gibran and Lisa, they interact some more and they the love story buds and they start um they basically start making out and uh and then Hedda walks in and catches them performing a water ritual where they have to share the water from every part of the body, which basically means uh which involves eating her out, <laughs> which is kinda funny but kinda fucked up at the same time. I'm like, oh, oh, all this obsession with water. Someone's been reading Dune. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. That whole scene is just kind of, huh? But it is kind of funny. And so Prine, he kind of takes charge of the situation. He explains it to the passengers. And he asks for volunteers to check the vents and crawl spaces. And Rossiter has made it to the front. And there's this whole thing where he catches a news report where he's, like, his death has been, the news of his, his supposed death has made it out. And apparently his company stock has gone up without him. And at first, I was like, oh, no, this is going to be like a comedy thing with him. But it actually ends up being kind of interesting because it, it leads to him and Debbie kind of appreciating each other a little more and leads to a pretty satisfying conclusion to that character. So I'll get to that when we get there. But I actually like that pretty well. But but Prime asks for volunteers, so Rossiter volunteers. Um, a few people do. Um, Lardner and Essiker do, as well as Wayne Scott and Tony does. And so Gibran shows up and... And so Gibran shows up and he like he takes Prime off to the side and he says, hey, um, two people on this train, you know, killed my grandfather, but they were masked at the time. And so I can only recognize them by their movements because there's that whole thing about how they always have the Beddoes wear masks. And so they they rely on hand gesture and body language, which was a really cool and creative idea. But he says, but he said, but it. it and this subplot is a little muddled because it seems like he knows who one of them is, but then he doesn't. Because it seems like he's pretty sure that Essaker is, but that he's not sure about Lardner. And so Prime like starts assigning guard to and sends en Essaker off to the engineer's compartment, presumably so that he can't cause trouble. And so they're they're checking this trap door down into the bilge, and then he open Tony opens it without thinking. A tendril grabs his foot, and so they close the door again, sever the tendril, and save his life. Then the doctor is called, and Wayne Scott's like, well, we're going to have to amputate this withered foot. And then at first they're going to do it with silverware. But then, then Prime's like, oh, wait, Hawk, you have a laser gun. Let's, let's take a lens out of one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the hologram things and focus it. And you'd think this would be a pretty horrific scene, but it's played for comedy because Tony downs this drug called Crosswire, which is only just barely talked about. And so they're, like, slowly severing his foot with a laser, and he starts, like, having, like, orgasms. It's like, he's like, it's like he's having a wet dream while it's going on. Like, and this scene is just so weird and so what the fuck. It's like, I don't know what to say to that scene. It's just kind of like, why are we doing this weird sex comedy thing in, in what should be a horrific, it's like they're not, it's like they don't want the script to be too scary or disturbing. I don't know. That's one thing about, about it where it's like i would have liked a little bit more of a horror vibe with the monster like because we get a little bit of that i would have liked a little bit more but yeah that whole scene just should have been 
I feel like like they should have played that a little more straight because that joke just doesn't play having him like cry out in, in ecstasy while it's going on. That's just that's just weird. <laughs> and so okay, and so at, at the, so the train starts to enter another tunnel, and then the creature settles into the kitchen car. And it start and it taps into the starboard ballast tank, and it's sucking the water out because it, it basically what it needs to do is that it, it's it's creating like a room where it's trying to set up a certain water level for it to stay and feed off of. And without the ballast, this is putting the train off balance. And Prime determines that they have to first speed up, and then he has to decouple cars. But the decoupling mechanism has been damaged. And he has to go out and do it by hand. And he's the only high level enough employee to have the thumb to use the thumbprint scanner. And so he decouples the car with the poor passengers in it. So they're safe and they're going to get rescued. That whole idea of like the rich and poor divide on the train completely gone after this point. So it's like, why bother? And so he goes to try and decouple the kitchen car. But Lardner, because apparently he, him and Essica are going to get a bonus for bringing this monster to London. He kills Hawk, and he who, who's watching it, who's like who's like watching the line that Prine's attached to, and then cuts Prine's line, and Prine manages to get back, but he lands in the kitchen car, and he has a close encounter with the creature, and he discovers from um from accidentally turning on the light because he's like he's like trying to get out of the car, he's like hot wiring the wires, and he turns on one of the lights, and he realizes that the creature's attracted the light because it's a plant, and so he man but he manages to get out. And then once the, the creature has enough water, it like ties off the ballast pipes, which restores the balance, which balances the train out again, and then manages to escape the tunnel perfectly fine. And and when, and when he closed the kitchen car door behind him, he cut a piece of the creature off, and Wayne Scott uh, autopsies it, and he says it has elements of both plant and animal physiology, and and he explains you know what the attraction to the light meant because plants are phototrophs; they get their energy from light and photosynthesis. And then we find out that the engineers are are all missing, and they're and the control room has been completely destroyed, and pieces have been taken. And so at first they're all like, "Oh, hey!" And there's blood all over the place. And first they're like, "Oh, hey, the monster must have done this." And I'm like, "Yeah, Essaker did that, because there's blood all over the place, and the creature sucks up fluid. You should have figured this out already, seriously." And so they can't slow down at the Quebec station, which is either Quebec City or Montreal. They don't explain. And so they decide that they're going to have to derail the train on purpose before they reach London and cause like a huge disaster by crashing into London. And so they decide that before they do that, they're going to have to deal with the creature. And so they so they lure the creature into the baggage car with lights and trap it inside the baggage car and it kills Daphne. They trap it inside like this cage that they drop on it and Prime like there's this bit where Prine and Sorry they fall down into like the bilge and then their romance builds and that whole scene isn't it's not the greatest romance. In fact, I think the teenage romance is is a little bit better developed than this one is because they they argue the whole time and then suddenly they're just like oh hey we have a connection. <laughs> Maybe with Stallone and Kim Basinger acting it out instead of just reading on the page it might actually work a little bit better depending on the chemistry they have, but it's also kind of eh. But so he does this thing. Now, so Prine, while he's down in the bilge, does this thing where he taps into a maglev motivator. And somehow he has, like, this this ticker tape thing, and he uses it to tap out the Morse code signal. Like, it's picked up in Quebec, and they figure out that, oh, they're going to um, derail it on this place called the Icelandic Incline. And then Dupree also picks up on the signal. He makes a video call, and Prine gets pissed at him. And so he fires Prine, threatens him with jail time, and then Prine, like, moons him. And at this point, I'm like, okay, is that why Stallone made the specialist? Because he missed out on the chats to flash his ass in the isobar. So he did the specialist and flash his ass in that movie. <laughs> that was what was running through my head. This would have been a better movie than the specialist. So while this is going on, the creature punches through its cage and escapes. And we don't see it again for quite a while. And Gibran figures out that Prine is the second man that he's looking for. And so Prine goes to confront Essaker for some reason. For some reason, he goes to Essaker, and this is when he realizes that he killed the crew. And so they fight. And it's a, and it's a fairly intense fight, but um, he eventually gets Essaker tied like like tied up on a chair and starts interrogating him and punching him. And this is kind of stupid because when he's punching him, he breaks the part of the control room that they need to get the train working again, which is kind of like, eh, you could have uh, you you could have written that part out. He's just beating up, going, let's play Jeopardy. You answer a question, and you won't be in Jeopardy. And just starts punching him, which is kind of fun. And so basically, he's he's trying to get Essaker to explain, but the only thing he knows is that it's important to a biotech company of some kind and that he's been hired to escort it. 
And then Wayne Scott enters, pulls a gun on Prime, and reve- and there's like some other people in the room, and reveals that he's been in charge the whole time. Which was a twist I honestly did not see coming, because Wayne Scott is so just not a factor in so many scenes. I wasn't thinking of him as part of the bigger picture. I, I wasn't thinking of him really as being part of the bigger picture. But but so he's, so he so he gives this big um he, he gives Horde a big exposition dump and he says that the creature is called a Boromez, which is a term he nicked from a um Jorge Luis Borges book, which if that's how you pronounce it, I've heard of this guy, I've never read anything of him and that it, because it refers to a creature that has both plant and animal, so he nicked it. So it's like you're not even a creative scientist. You can't even give a scientific name to something. So it's like I don't like that name, it just sounds weird. And so the idea is that it's supposed to grow and grow, and then eventually it will somehow restore the environment, and that this hostility is just part, it's part of a phase it's supposed to go through where it, where it needs to absorb as much water as possible, then eventually it will change, and then, like, it'll, like, it'll, like, Pokemon evolve into a different form, and then, like, send out a bunch of spores that will help um, restore the planet. And that it was not supposed. It was not supposed to. That they're working for this company called Biodyne. That wasn't have supposed to have grown this to this to this size until they reached the lab in London. But of course, you know the distraction happened, and so it got out. And so Wayne Scott Lardner and uh, and Essaker they seal themselves inside another inside like in like another car with their own cabins, and so. He calls up O'Bannon, who's this Biodyne employed mercenary, to because they need tools to help capture the monster, and so that team gets on a helicopter for Iceland. And so the incline is coming up, and so all this stuff needs to happen. But before that, I gotta mention that Jabrod actually went back to the baggage car and he grabbed some of Hedda's medication, and so those two begin to appreciate each other. And so I found their relationship kind of made that sort of love story between those two younger people made that a little bit more interesting than I find it weird that like like the teenage romance is like blah but like him earning the respect of of the grandmother actually was kind of interesting and the fact that and she also mentions about how because like all these different places have been abandoned he's now like the grand mayor of Burbank which I thought was kind of funny which also kind of wins her over a little bit and so and so the enclave is coming up and the Prime puts something on the maglev unit that that's about to blow, that's supposed to like blow up the maglev thing and cause them to derail. But the problem is that Wayne Scott has cut the hydraulic life pods in the other cars besides his, so it has to be done manually the second time. That's a thing in this script. And so Prime and Sorry argue about who has to stay behind the manual controls, but Reggie pulls out a gun. And then he says he's going to do it because if he comes back, his company is just going to tank again. And he's had this sort of personal revelation. So he pulls out this newly handwritten will where he says he's going to take care of Debbie and make sure that, you know, she make sure that because, I mean, he didn't treat her very well in the past. but He's going to make sure she's OK in the future. And so he decides he's going to to pull the thing and sacrifice his life in the crash. And I'm like, you know, a character I didn't really care that much about from the beginning. Yeah, he really came through and made himself worthwhile. I actually quite like him. And then the train crashes and tears apart. The passengers are fine. And then and and you see the Isobar Patrol in Quebec still don't know what the city is. They they send out rescue helicopters. And so Wayne Wayne Scott and the other two guys are like, oh, crap, there's more passengers here. And they, they're all alive. So they go to try and kill them. And then Gibran uppercuts Lard, Lardner with, like, his staff. And I'm not sure if that killed him or not. And then the creature, like, Wayne Scott gets, like, gets, like pinned under something, and then the creature kills him. And then Prine kills Essaker with a flare gun, which was pretty cool. Like he, which for some reason, just punches a hole through him. And there, there was a pretty decent one-liner in there that I, uh, I might have to check the script real quick just to see what that was. It was actually kind of cool. Uh, no, he says, um, Essaker's like, looks like it's your turn to play Jeopardy. And then he shoots him and goes, sorry, that wasn't phrased as a question. <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. And so what happens now is that is that the helicopter shows up, the 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 mercenary helicopter shows up, shoots one of the wrecked cars and like pins the creature underneath it. And Brian is dodging the gunfire and he finds an intact maglev unit, which is the the technology. It's like a magnetic levitation thing, which is how the the train works, which is actually based on real technology, which didn't work so well because restoring like the sealant. Because they did make trains like this at one point, but it didn't work because they had to like spend a lot of money on the sealant or something like that. But 
but he hurls the maglev unit at the helicopter, crashes into it, fucks up the controls, and causes it to crash into a nearby mountain, which is pretty cool. And this is where the script gets a little bit happy crappy for my tastes. So Pride, like, sees the creature pinned under the thing and decides he's going to help it, and for whatever reason, it doesn't kill him. And so he carries it on his back, drops it on the soil, and it shoves its tendrils into the ground, breaks open, and then bursts out again as this large alien tree, like something out of Avatar, and then, like, shoots a bunch of seeds into the wind, and that apparently is going to save the environment. I don't know, that was maybe a little bit too corny happy ending for me like maybe if it was written a little differently but that's still not a huge problem and so the passengers all make it to london which it's described as having been flooded because of the environmental stuff like like the water has actually reached up to the span of tower bridge which i thought was kind of interesting and so they all sort of you know go their separate ways like sorry and prine are together gibran and lisa are together and then debbie meets up with that oil magnate guy and they kind of they kind of have a thing but i'm like dude your 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 boyfriend who just showed a ton of appreciation for you just died maybe you don't move on to the next best thing quite yet but yeah that's the end of the script and i can say this was actually a pretty good script it had a fairly decent cast of characters going for it and some who actually surprised me in the directions they went in kind of a cool idea of a monster some, some very good scenes like prime crawling along the outside of the train while it's moving at high speed the fight scene in the baggage car them capturing the plant monster in the baggage car um some fight scenes with essaker the whole fight scene against the helicopter at the end where they blow it up with the maglev that's really cool so yeah there's a lot of really cool stuff in there there's like twists and turns with the thing with wayne scott and the development with um rossiter and the development with um jabron and hedda so yeah it's actually a really solid idea of this movie that's kind of like the poseidon adventure in the sense it, it, it's it's like an Erwin allen movie like the poseidon adventure in the sense that like you have all these different characters and they have their little journeys and what makes it really interesting is the fact that um roland emmerich didn't want to direct this version because it reads a little bit like what roland emmerich would kind of define his career with with something like independence day with this big ensemble cast of characters which he then did over and over and over again to the point where it was just like, now, if Roland Emmerich did direct this, this, I think this would have been pretty solid, but I don't think we would have gotten Universal Soldier if he had done this. Now, I'm not sure I would, um, I would sacrifice Universal Soldier for this movie. But overall, I can say I thought the script was very good. It had a few things that could have been tweaked here and there, but on the whole, it was actually a pretty solid read. I think it would have been a very good movie. Now, the creature was, um, they actually had hired Rick Baker to design the creature, and his model work for it is actually really cool, and it would have been an interesting monster to see. Now, granted, you can't really see the creature's face that it's described as having on, on it, but, like, I mean, it would have been cool to see what he would have done with that. And Rick Baker's work is just generally pretty great. And 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 also, like, but yeah, that would have been pretty cool. But pretty much what happens is that they were moving forward, trying to get it made, and then... And then more, and it was serious because it doesn't, it doesn't sound like they actually had a director hired on. Like they had all these actors that they either wanted or they had signed on and they were doing all this design work. They were getting, they're creating the creature, creating the costumes, all this stuff. But it didn't, it doesn't sound like they had a director signed on after Roland Emmerich left. But then because of Cutthroat Island, Karolka went bankrupt. And so this version of the project went under. But then it kind of comes back a little bit because it, because all their properties went up for auction in, does it say the year here? Does not say, but basically it went up for auction, and D'Souza said he tried to buy it back, but it was too expensive for him. And the Coralco guys, Casser and Vinia, they tried to buy it back, but they couldn't. And it actually got bought back by um, Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin talked Sony Pictures into buying it back for them at Vert for quite a lot of money i'm guessing because it was going for millions and i'm assuming this was before godzilla came out and bombed and lost a shitload of money and and lost a shitload of money and underperformed so they got sony to buy it back for them and it was one of those things where where basically eventually they sort of split up and went their separate ways but they had certain projects that they wanted to do together and isobar was one of them i believe um the stargate sequel they've been talking about for years has been one of them sadly independence day resurgence was one of them and it actually got made which i haven't seen that movie but it was pretty bad but eventually around uh 2001 devlin went to uh tab murphy who had worked on some projects for them he had done some disney movies 
and he worked on um, a thing called Super Tanker, which was a film they never got off the ground. And apparently he did a version of Fantastic Voyage for them, I guess after the the, the Glenn Morgan and uh, Wong version of it. And, and so, and he also wrote a, tr- not mentioned in the book, but he also wrote a treatment for um, a Godzilla 2, which actually wasn't too bad and would have been a slightly better movie than the first one. And for the record, I don't mind the Roland Emmerich Godzilla movie that much. Like, it doesn't really work as a Godzilla movie, but as a monster movie, it's perfectly fine. Like, it would be better if it was, like, half an hour to 45 minutes shorter and you cut the love story out of it, but it's an okay monster movie. And so around, basically around 2001, Devlin hired Tab Murphy to take a crack at the project, and the, and the title was changed to Isobar Run, and this meaning of Isobar was slightly changed to Intercontinental Superconducting instead of subterranean oscillating ballistic automatic instead of aerodynamic and it's set in 2097 i wonder if there would still be king charles and queen Di jokes in there and new los angeles is flourishing underground and on the toxic surface they apparently like they do like queen sleep they do like sweet there there's these like bio suited science cops who do murderous sweet i guess they like they they wipe out like the life forms and, like, the idea of the Beddoes still sticks around. They scratch a living on the surface. And then Prine, who in this version is a new recruit for the science cops, he rescues a 12-year-old Beddo named Ollie from a cleanup squad. And then they end up going below ground, and they're, they're watching the, the maiden voyage of the Isobar Mark V. And in this version, it's still intercontinental, but it's going from Los Angeles to Hawaii and then finally Tokyo. And so they, and like, it sounds to me like Ollie kind of goes onto the train and then Prine sneaks on with him. And so they're both stowaways. Like he goes after him and they're both kind of stowaways. And in this one, it's still like a plant monster, but it's like, but like, it like instinctively hunts down water in arid conditions. Now, I don't know about the whole thing about it, about it restoring the environment, according to this, but, but the creature is like hunting people down and it builds a dense jungle of vines and webbing in which it stores victim, which is stores its victims, which is just basically just alien. Seems like a cool idea and would have added to that horror edge, which I would have liked a little bit more from the DeSalza draft. And that would have been, in, and it would have covered, of course, it would have covered every last inch of surface area, creating an alien, otherworldly environment. That would have been really cool to see, I think. It actually also reminds me of um, First Contact when the Borg just completely take over the engineering deck of the Enterprise. And eventually it, um, and, and eventually, you know, the, the train starts becoming a runaway train and all that stuff. Apparently half of the train's thousand passengers are dead and most of the rest are injured. Okay, according to this, pride discovers that the creature has the potential to replenish the Earth's stagnant oxygen supply within 10 years, assuming it isn't killed first. Can pride risk destroying the creature, even if it represents mankind's only hope of returning to the surface? So some of those ideas are there, but it sounds like they've been reframed into a different thing. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit. I, like I said, I like the cocooning idea for um, because it gives it a little bit more of that alien feel to it, which I think would have been cool. And I like the idea of them crossing the ocean and only having those two stops because it really adds to the sense of isolation and the sense of urgency that they're trapped inside this thing with this creature with no way of getting out or getting away. And so you wouldn't have to do the weird thing where they stop, but then they have to find a way to get the train going again to keep the story going. I feel like that would have been an interesting idea. Now, I'd like to read the script just to see how it plays out. Like, I'd like to read those two Jim Wool's versions, and if that rough Dean Devlin version ever shows up, I'd like to read that as well. But I think that could that actually sounds like an interesting take on the material, and it seems to me like the only like there's no real specific reason for why it didn't get made. Basically, it seems like it was a budget thing, and no one wanted. It. They couldn't like find any studio that wanted to spend two hundred million dollars on their version of Isobar, so so it just never happened. So that's a shame, and it, it's one of those things where they occasionally will mention this something they want to do. I think the well, okay, I say recent. This was a like twelve years ago at this point, but two thousand and six they started talking about it again, and I mean. I mean, if it's them making it, like, maybe it could still be good. I mean, Independence Day Resurgence, everything I've heard about that doesn't give me a whole lot of hope for them producing, like, a good version of Isobar. But I'd like to read that draft just to see what it's like. But that's the end of the Isobar run, basically. Um, It's, it's the end of the line. Sorry for the pun. But, yeah, I think the script, the, the Salsa draft was actually really good. I'd like to read the Jim Wools and Tab Murphy versions. 
But yeah, I think if the Steven DeSalza version had been made, I think it would have been a well-regarded film. I mean, I'd be perfectly willing to Terminator my way back into the past and keep Cutthroat Island from happening so we could get, potentially get both Isobar and Crusade, the Arnold movie. But I mean, it is what it is. So yeah, that was Isobar, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed the episode. Until next time, bye. That actually went pretty well. So yeah, guys, until next time, bye.